everyone. Welcome to Robotics Today. Uh, I'm honored to introduce today uh, Siddhartha Srinivasa, or Sid, as uh, we, uh, we call him. Uh, Sid is professor uh, of computer science at the uh, School of, uh, of Computer Science at, at the University of Washington. Um, he's IEEE Fellow and Director of Robotics AI at Amazon, but uh, for all of us today, uh, most importantly and above all, he's Founder and Director of the Personal Robotics Lab, probably the thing that we know him the most for. Um, Sid is interested in enabling robots to interact with people and uh, um, perform dexterous manipulation. And um, it's, it's an honor to sort of introduce him and describe a uh, very, diffi very difficult task of describe his career, right? So Sid's career has always felt very fast for everyone that had the privilege to be around him. Um, and at, in 1999, he arrived very young uh, as a student to CMU where he spent um, uh, many years, uh, 18, I think. Uh, and by 2005, he founded the Personal Robotics Lab. And through a period of, through a few transitions through Intel and then CMBU, and now more recently at the University of Washington, um, he sort of um, contributed to our community um, almost at the, at the full stack of uh, po any possible level in which you can think of, of making a contribution in robotics, right? So he has built iconic systems like um, Herb or ADA, um, or Chimp, he has uh, contributed to software software frameworks like OpenRay for Dart. Um, he has coded uh, algorithms or helped code algorithms like CVIRT or Chump or BAT Star, and uh, he has proven some uh, theorems along the way. So um, um, many different contributions at many different uh, levels, and. Um, Sid, I was trying to do my homework to introduce you. Uh, so I, I checked again your last talk um, in 2017 at CMBU, sort of kind, of kind of your farewell talk. And uh, I, 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 you said a sentence that I really liked. You were encouraging, um, towards the end, you, you were encouraging yourself and everyone else to commit to work on problems that can change people's lives, um, which I, uh, I thought it was an extremely powerful statement. And uh, um, I couldn't uh, um, stop to notice that uh, in the abstract of your talk today, you said that you would describe a few open problems that you would like all of us to solve so that you could retire. Um, is that the kind of change in people's lives that you were uh, referring to so that you can retire, <laughs> Sid? Uh, well, I think, uh, thank you, yes. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the, for the, for the glowing introduction. Um, uh, I mostly remember Alberto and, and, and his wife, Nuria, as uh, people who had kids at about the same time as we did. And, um, um, you know, I'm really grateful for his friendship and uh, compassion and um, the really fantastic tiramisu that uh, we still miss a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and so next time we meet, I, I need some more of that tiramisu. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Yes, I, I, I am old and I hope to retire and uh, <laughs> hopefully that'll happen at some point soon. Thanks, thanks everyone. I'm going to start my talk. Let's see if I can uh, work the internets and share my screen. Um, excellent. Everybody can see this, hopefully. Great. <clears throat> um, I, it's a pleasure to be speaking to such a, a distributed and distinguished audience. Uh, you know, I see some faces here, uh, but I'm sure there are many other faces that are out there, wherever you are. Uh, this is my kids' playroom, so they might walk in any moment, so no swearing. Um, and, um, uh, you know, these are really strange and fantastic times for all of us, and uh, please stay safe and uh, and stay connected. It's also a really nice opportunity for us to be able to share our work across such a big and broad audience. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some of uh, the work that I've been doing, uh, trying to understand motion planning better. Motion planning is a gift that keeps on giving. There's just so many layers of onions 
And um, I'm also going to try and connect it a little bit more formally uh, with machine learning, hopefully leave you with a set of uh, frameworks as well as some thoughts on how to, how to move this problem forward. Uh, most importantly, uh -oh, um, you know, these are definitely problems I want you to solve so that I can retire. Uh, that's me uh, walking into the sunset uh, as a retired uh, professor. Um, it's, it's amusing because uh, my father is very old and he's a professor and he still hasn't retired. So um, I am very wary of promises of retirement, uh, no matter where they come from. Um, but, you know, everything that I've done here is the work of fantastic students. Like Alberto mentioned, uh, you know, we personal robotics lab is a family and uh, I am merely a vehicle of all of the wonderful successes of my students. Uh, many of whom, like Alberto, have gone off and done amazing, great things. Um, and I'm super excited about sharing some of their work. So today, what I'm doing is, uh, is sharing their work and I'll call it out at, uh, at different points. Um, so I'm gonna talk about motion planning. Um, you know, since this is a very broad audience, I'll give you a little bit of an intro, but like that's the extent of my, my keynote skills. Motion planning is really simple. It's the art of getting a robot from A to B without bumping into stuff. That's all you need to do. Get a robot from one place to another and not bump into stuff. Turns out this is a, uh, an impossible problem, actually provably impossible problem. Uh, but yet we move from place to place ourselves and yet we get our robots occasionally uh, to be able to go from one place to another and not bump into stuff. So here's some examples of that, uh, this is a robot Herb that's uh, um, performing a really important task, which is uh, you know separating the cookie from the cream of an Oreo. This is actually um, a commercial that uh, was shot by by Oreo, and already you can see here there's some complexities involved, which uh, are very interesting in particular to manipulation in that you need to stay away from obstacles, but you need to get really close to stuff that you want to pick up. Fundamentally, manipulation has this tension of wanting to stay away from stuff but also wanting to go right next to the thing you want to pick up as well as you saw some sort of bimanual manipulation that was happening there. <clears throat> as Alberto mentioned, like I'm really passionate about building robots that can actually help people who are in need of care. Here's another robot that um, is uh, helping people uh, with upper extremity disabilities use robot arms um, to actually feed themselves. So this is our, uh, an assisted feeding project. And here again, there's the challenge of being able to work with deformable objects, the challenge of being able to reconfigure yourself and reconfigure the arms such that uh, you can work with and around people. Uh, this is another robot, an RCTA robot, which is uh, an outdoor robot that is trying to uh, clear rubble. Uh, the complexity here is the fact that there is just a lack of structure uh, or at least a lack of sort of known structure in the item that you're trying to pick up. It's just tree branches and stuff and everything else. And so thinking about configuration spaces and thinking about planning where the, uh, the geometry is fairly complicated is interesting too. And finally, even when you have sort of fairly structured environments um, like these robots at Berkshire Gray, there is a lot of coordination and planning that's needed to actually get them to work at peak performance such that they can really perform the tasks that they're supposed to perform. So there's two things common to all these uh, robots that I showed you. Um, number one is that I built them. Um, and number two is that uh, the algorithms that go into producing their motions are the algorithms that I'm gonna talk about today. So by the end of today, uh, you'll know pretty much how to build these robots and, and to plan their motions. So I would also start off by saying that uh, motion planning is indeed a technology. Uh, I was at a talk by Stephen Boyd and he said, well, convex optimization is a technology. Uh, you can download um, a software framework like OMPL or OpenRay or other things, uh, download OMPL, it's way better, um, and, um, and really get um, motion planning working. You can get a robot to go from place to place. So you might ask the question, like, why am I giving this talk at all like, if, if motion planning is a technology? But I think much like sort of convex optimization, if you care about getting sort of 10 to 100x improvement in your planning algorithms, 
it is actually important to open the black box and think a little bit deeply about how these algorithms work. And so today I'm going to talk to you about how you might want to get this kind of improvement in your plotting algorithms. I'd also caveat by saying that sometimes, although 10 to 100x sounds great, sometimes it's not necessary. Sometimes motion planning is not the big bottleneck in your entire stack. Sometimes it's perception, sometimes it's the actual motion of the robot. So I would tell you that, like, you know, first of all, profile your code and understand whether you need that improvement in your plotting algorithms and be very um, strategic about how you actually optimize your code. But in my own experience, I've felt that uh, as you start optimizing other things, motion planning eventually becomes a bottleneck and there is value in actually being able to build robots that can go much faster. So I'll start with sort of the very fundamental motion planning problem. Uh, this is from Schwartz and Cherie. It's a, it's a classic uh, set of papers. On the lower right here or left for you, um, I have the, the link or the, the citation, so please check it out and I'll put these slides up online for you. Um, the Schwartz and Cherie paper, it's a set of papers that actually just talked about a very, very simple problem, which is how do you get um, a piano um, from one place to another in your home? It's called the piano movers problem. I'd also note that I spent a whole bunch of time trying to think about where to put the apostrophe um, it's definitely not the piano movers problem. It's the piano movers problem. There's the plurality of piano movers who are hopefully like going to be trying to solve this problem. Um, Schwartz and Sharir actually don't put an apostrophe anywhere, which really bugged me about their paper. Uh, but other than that, fantastic paper, really fantastic paper. Uh, but the idea is really, really simple, right? You need to be able to get a, um, a robot to go from one place to another without colliding with obstacles that exist. Um, and I think this is another thing that I wanna emphasize, which is almost always uh, problems live much, much longer than solutions. Like asking the correct problem is timeless, right? Schwartz and Scherier proposed this piano movers problem, you know, when I was three <laughs> and, um, now we're still thinking about these problems and still uh, asking ourselves like what these problems should be. So a uh, piece of advice would be like ask good problems and think about how to, uh, how to formulate them. Um, well, the, the traditional way of solving these problems um, is to build a roadmap, um, which is a set of points that are connected. And uh, to then turn this continuous problem into a discrete problem. Now you have a discrete problem of like, hey, I have a graph, I need to search on the graph. And you just go and plan on that roadmap. So today I'm actually gonna focus on planning on the roadmap. Building the roadmap itself is a very interesting, hard, challenging problem. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, and again, this sort of the, the seminal work by Lydia Kavraki on probabilistic roadmaps that sort of launched this whole idea of, well, Let's build a roadmap first. Not very different from a road network that you might be familiar with. And then let's turn this into a problem of planning on that, that roadmap. So today we'll focus on deterministic planning on sort of known fixed roadmaps. Now, as soon as you look at a graph, the first thing you want to do is like slam A star at it. Uh, so here's A star search and uh, it's gorgeous and it works. And uh, you know, whenever I teach A star search, um, the first thing that people tell me, apparently, that it's optimal. Oh my goodness, it's optimal. Like, why would I do anything else? Like, A star search is optimal. Um, and then I ask them, like, is it actually optimal or something we care about? Like, okay, you can be optimal, but like, is it, is it optimal about um, something that our actual planning method cares about? And, and then people sort of phase out. They're like, oh, optimal, surely it's optimal. Um, and actually, um, I was one of those people too, who are like, oh man, search, it's optimal. Like, let's move on with life. Uh, and so I'm gonna give you this personal journey of how I myself like started thinking about search differently. Um, it all started with um, a talk given at Carnegie Mellon by Ariel Feldner. Ariel's a fantastic professor uh, at Ben Gurion, and he gave this like super technical talk, but he started it with like, you know, the heart of heuristic search, that's you know, still beating. He was very passionate about it. He had like, you know, amusing uh, and endearing uh, little heart shapes all over his talk. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Like, here's this super smart guy who spent a lot of time thinking about search. I just thought search was optimal. Like, why are we even looking into it? So I started 
reading some papers on surge. You know, this is the infamous Victor and Pearl paper, which I would not recommend you read until you've taken lots of combinatorial optimization courses and had a little bit of alcohol, maybe. Uh, but it's a it, it's an incredibly complicated space, uh, a really really hard problem. There's like nested eggs of things that are actually sideways, and it doesn't matter if they're sideways because they still don't make sense. And uh, and so I was incredibly confused, like why why is a star search so hard? <clears throat> and really, like my like aha moment um, came when I read um, Jaya Pearl's really fantastic book on heuristics. Like this is perhaps the best book you can ever read if you want to know. First, what are the real questions to ask in search? And secondly, how to ask good questions, right? This is a, a remarkable book. I, I've read it cover to cover. I almost read it cover to cover every year. Um, sort of like the Boyd and Van Bay convex optimization book. Um, and, and Pearl was able to take this concept of heuristics. Like as soon as you think about heuristics, you think, ah, oh, it's just like, we're just gonna make stuff up and we'll call that heuristic. And he was able to formalize that in mathematical language. So it was just really, really elegant. Um, and the other book, uh, actually this is uh, a PhD thesis that really inspired me was Ira Pohl's PhD thesis. And here there was one page which really changed my entire view of search where he started talking about search as amoebas, right? He was like, well, think of search as these amoebas that are wandering around in a graph and they meet, and when they meet, like things happen. I was like, oh my God, I finally understand. And ever since I have described, and my students and my postdocs and collaborators will attest, I can describe every single search algorithm with amoebas, and I'm gonna do that today. Uh, but I think uh, at a higher order bit, um, what's really important is to understand the perspective and the intuition of the problem more than understanding the mechanics of how something works, right? Like it's, I think, being able to describe, like I always try to describe my algorithms to my kids, and that's really rewarding because then you want to be able to distill it to the essence such that you can you can really get it without having to go deep into the details. And I contend that no matter how hard an algorithm is, you can describe it to your kids. Okay, here I go. So A star search with amoeba. So this is very, very simple. Uh, and thanks to bacteria vectors by VecEasy for, for the uh, PNG. Um, imagine that you have a, an amoeba that's starting at the start and it wanders around trying to search to find to, to get to the goal. Whenever it gets to a vertex, uh, it has a decision to make. Do I go left or do I go right, right? Unlike us, an amoeba can just do both. So the amoeba clones itself and says, well, I'll just go both ways, right? Um, this is a unit speed amoeba. It's a very special kind of amoeba that moves at unit speed along the curve. And it just, just happens on and on, right? So it reached another vertex and it was like, oh, I'll just split into two and I'll just keep going. I'll just keep going. Now, something magical happens when one of the amoebas reaches a point that another amoeba has already been. Imagine that amoebas are leaving these slime trails. I, I'm sure that's not true, but like, let's imagine they're leaving slime. An amoeba comes and sees slime on a vertex or an edge even when you're running bidirectional searches. Uh, and it has to do something utterly magical. It just dies. It just sits there and it just dies. And the, the reason why it dies is actually very interesting in mathematical is because of what's called the optimal substructure. Right? Uh, optimal substructure basically says that amoebas that are following other amoebas will never catch up, right? So if uh, the cost function is F, if one function is less than the other, no matter what else you add on top of that, it is never going to catch up. Optimal substructure is essentially the only reason why the Bellman condition or any of these searches can be optimal, right? Otherwise, you're going to have a combinatorial number of amoebas, right? And as a homework, um, I'm going to ask you so first of all, it's very easy to see that if you have additive cost, if your function f is additive, so f of a less than f of b implies f of a plus f of x less than f of b plus f of x, things the f of x's cancel out. So if you have additive cost, it's pretty trivial to see that um, 
you know, you'll maintain optimal substructure. So I'm going to give you a homework to think about five different other cost functions that have the optimal substructure and think of two cost functions that don't have the optimal substructure and email them to me if you wish, right? There's many, there's infinitely many. So if you don't have optimal substructure, then you're screwed, kind of. Uh, we've written papers on what you can do if you don't have it, but fundamentally what, what you care about is optimal substructure. It basically says you will never catch up. Now, a, a follow-up of the optimal substructure, substructure uh, is actually a very positive uh, message, right? Optimal substructure basically says die if you see slime in front of you. The Bellman condition is actually just a local version, a local variant of the optimal substructure. What it says is, well, if you are an amoeba and you want to continue surviving, try to be best as much as you can locally, right? So it takes the, the global, global equation of optimal substructure and condenses it down to a way of life. How do you behave? You want to try to be as locally optimal as possible. So this is essentially all of search, right? Like you wanna make sure that you exploit the optimal substructure and you can do that locally via the Bellman condition. Now, ASAR search essentially talks about favoritism. It says like, well, okay, um, I have these three amoeba children. Who do I want to progress forward, right? Like maybe each amoeba is like a space in your memory buffer. And you're like, well, I got this, like, I only have so much memory, so I need to prioritize the amoebas that I want to push forward, right? Um, and here again, I'm going to tell you one other principle that works really well, which is called uh -oh, um, optimism in the face of uncertainty, right? This is another principle that I use repeatedly over and over again. The, the sort of the, the yin and yang version of it is, you should always be optimistic under uncertainty, right? Always be optimistic under uncertainty. You'll either be correct and then yay, you're one, or you'll learn something really, really important if you're wrong, right? If you're wrong, you'll be like, hey, I shouldn't have taken that path. That, I sh that, that would have, might have been optimal, right? And so what the A star search does is that it basically says, well, I'm gonna add my most optimistic uh, thought of which of these amoebas is going to be successful, which is called a heuristic. Ideally, you want a heuristic that's consistent, which means that it's um, both admissible and satisfies triangle inequality. Uh, but essentially, A star search is an OFU algorithm. OFU is what optimism in the face of uncertainty is called by the cool kids. So I'm just copying that phrase. Um, so A star is just an OFU algorithm. So you can just prove uh, you know, all the things that you want to uh, prove on ASAR using any sort of OFU proof. So it turns out this generalizes to uh, reinforcement learning also. So the, the most amazing RMAX paper is something that is, again, some, uh, a paper that I would encourage you to read. The proofs are glorious, really nice, really interesting. But RMAX also says that like, hey, whatever reward I don't know about, I'm just going to assume it's my max award. So RMAX is an OFU algorithm. But I'm just going to continue along. So um, optimism in the face of uncertainty is something that I often use when I have uncertainty and I don't have a lot of time to figure out what to do. And I'll, I'll, I'll get more into that later. So those are our amoebas, right? Uh, and A star search is optimal uh, because it expands the fewest number of vertices. So it sends out the fewest number of amoebas um, of any search forward search algorithm that has the same amount of information. Right? You have a, access to a heuristic, you have your graph. Right? Now, the interesting thing is that, like, is this really what we care about in motion planning? Like, who cares about amoebas? I don't know, do you? Maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Right? And it turns out, and this is a really nice paper by Chris Hauser in 2015, which had this diagram in their paper which is about like, hey, here's the amount of time you're spending and here's the percentage of time that is being spent by what are called edge evaluations, right? Like, which is the amount of slime that you're putting on your path rather than the number of amoebas themselves. And obviously there's, it's dominant, right? And so I was like, huh, well, that's interesting. Um, amoebas are cheap, right? Slime is expensive. And A star search is like hand wavy and people like, oh yeah, you know, the fewer the amoeba, surely the lesser the slime. But like, that's actually not true, right? It's, it's, there's not, no one has actually proven that. Uh, so the, the natural question that one can ask is, is there a search algorithm that minimizes the number of edge evaluations? Edge evaluations are the amount of slime. 
turns out this is an open problem uh, for ever since search has been around for about 40 to 50 years. Um, and the idea here is that I don't care about amoebas, what algorithm minimizes the amount of slime. Um, we solved this problem um, last year, I think two years ago, well, it's been a while. Um, and we were able to provide the first true of the edge optimal A star like search algorithm, uh, which minimizes the number, amount of slime that you're gonna drop. And I'm gonna describe that to you with amoebas and slime. It's pretty easy. It's also just about a four to five line modification to your existing A star code and can make it run you know, 10 to 100 times faster. But before I show you the algorithm, here's how the algorithm works, performs. So that's lazy SP, which is our algorithm on the right. And that's A star. I can keep going. It's, it's actually really fun to watch lazy SP kick ass. Um, there's more. I mean, this can go on forever. It's probably optimal. So it's always going to do as well or better than the other one. Uh, bug trap, all of that. So. Um, and again, like both algorithms have the same amount of information. So there's no, no nothing I'm hiding here uh, under the um, covers. So how does this work? So ASR, lazy SP essentially really flips the paradigm of uh, ev evaluating edges to think about search as a greedy best for search over paths. Right? I have an infinitum of paths. Actually, I have some, some common real number of paths that I can take from start to goal. I want to rephrase my thinking of like, hey, I'm moving along edges to moving along paths. And Lazy SP uses a very, 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 very simple idea. Right? Basically says, to find the shortest path, eliminate all shorter paths right? by definition. Right? Um, and so it, it tells you to think about search, not in terms of edges, and open lists and priority queues, but just as a search over paths, right? Like you have all of these lifetimes that you can live and you wanna pick the lifetime that is optimal, right? So it asks you to think a little bit more holistically about how you're searching. How does this work, right? Um, Lazy SP essentially is OFU on steroids, right? Like it's optimism, it's, it's wildly, violently, la la optimistic, right? Um, and it essentially, breaks the search problem down into two pieces, right? Uh, a star search is inefficient because it uses its amoebas and its slime to do two things, right? Like one is find the shortest path. And the second is evaluate edges to see if they're valid or not. So what lazy SP does is that it breaks it down into two, two problems, Like right? The first problem is a ghost amoeba. Think of it as like Schrodinger's amoeba. It doesn't know whether it needs to live or die which is just optimistic and searches for the shortest path without sliming anything at all. So it does not evaluate any edges whatsoever. So this is pretty much free for us, right? And then once the ghost amoeba has found the shortest path, I mean, clearly it's like blasting through those pink obstacles. That's when you slime your known shortest paths, right? Like you send out your actual amoebas over your known shortest paths, you hit an edge that is in collision, you update your graph and then you just repeat the process over and over again, right? So you keep sliming until you hit something and then you have optimal slime, right? Um, so what it's doing is that it is persistently and consistently eliminating paths that are shorter and shorter. And in the end, it is able to get to something that is the shortest path, right? So it's a, it's a fundamentally different perspective of search than A star which ASAR is an incredibly cautious dude, right? ASAR is trying to very carefully evaluate edges such that at any point you can like get something that's short and build that horizon, but like, who cares, right? Like in the end, I wanna go from start to goal. So the combination of sending out these sort of ghost amoebas and evaluating the path. Now, actually the path evaluation that I showed you is just a forward path evaluation but you can do arbitrary path evaluations. Your path evaluation could be anything that you want. You could invent a path evaluation function that takes a path and checks like, hey, maybe I want to check randomly. Maybe I want to check using some kind of machine learning algorithm, which I'll talk about in a second, right? And so that's, when you combine that, so these are all the various selectors that you can try out trivially, right? You can say, hey, I want to search forward. The forward search algorithm is equivalent to the best you can do with an A-star-like algorithm. I can search backwards, right? The backward search algorithm is equivalent to something like the, akin to D star, right? Where you're, or D star light. Uh, you can search alternate. You can say, hey, I'm gonna check the first edge forward, the next edge backwards, forward, backwards. 
And that, I believe, is, uh, and this is an open question, equivalent to front-to-front -front bidirectional ASAR. Or you can do fancier things like bisection. You can say, hey, I'm going to check in a place that is furthest away from anything I've checked, because I think that might be, you know, that, that might be a good place to go. Um, so there, there's a universe of selectors that you can use. And so one question that you might ask, and this is another important concept to think about, is the realizability assumption, right? The realizability assumption is actually really important in any algorithm. Like, you know, I would say most machine learning algorithms like toss this away willy-nilly, um, except some banded algorithms. Um, but essentially what it says is that I have some hypothesis class Right? Imagine this hypothesis class is a set of all lazy SP selectors that I have. And you know, the forward selector is one of them, the alternate selector is one of them. The realizability assumption asks, is the oracle in your hypothesis class? Right? Imagine you are oracular, right? And you knew the optimal path, right? You knew what was the optimal path, you knew everything about every edge, but you could only whisper that to me through a uh, edge selector, right? I gave you the current optimal path and you're like, hey, kill this one, right? If you could only use that mechanism, would you be straightjacketed? Would you be frustrated at all uh, if with that sort of very like constrained mechanism, very constrained API that I gave you to transmit your oracular God-given knowledge to me? It turns out, and this is a proof that I am incredibly proud of, uh, the Oracle is a lazy SP selector. Um, it's actually simultaneously easy to prove and simultaneously incredibly complicated to prove. You use uh, some set cover assumption to prove it. But what this tells us is that it is possible, although probably impossible, um, to actually describe perfection via a lazy SP selector, right? So you can, the upper bound of your performance is perfection, right? Lower bound is really bad, but the upper bound is certainly perfection. And this actually uh, brings up a really interesting and open, somewhat open question, which is, can we learn to imitate the Oracle, right? Uh, imagine I gave you a whole bunch of oracular um, solutions, oracular selectors. You know, it's very computationally expensive, but maybe you do that offline. Can you actually learn to imitate that using structured prediction? Um, so we have a paper on this, but you know, that barely scratches the surface of being able to learn to imitate the Oracle. Um, and I think this is another sort of very interesting open problem of how you might want to think about search as imitating the lazy SP Oracle. But again, I, I want to point out one thing is that realizability is actually really important to prove, right? Uh, because if you don't prove it, then it basically says, I can't tell you how good I can be. Like if I had all the information in the world, I might still be suboptimal, right? And so uh, again, if you are writing an algorithm and you're proving something about it, like try to think about proving that it's realizable, right? That's, that's, a, that's an important concept. So uh, just to summarize this aspect of work. So is there a, a search algorithm that minimizes the number of edge validations? Yay, uh, it's lazy SP. It's the first provably edge optimal A star like search algorithm. Um, it's, it's a very simple and easy modification to your A star code because the internal engine, the ghost amoebas essentially run A star on the optimistic draft that you have. And then once you get the path, then you use a selector to pick which one you want. So try it out. Um, all I can tell you is that it's provably optimal. So use it <laughs> as you wish. Uh, there's still really interesting problems around how you might want to select the edges that you want to evaluate. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we move forward. Right? So uh, I've done lazy SP. Like, is this it? Is this over? Are we done? There's actually an interesting um, conundrum in motion planning, right? Um, which is if you want to care very deeply about the shortest path, then there's some amount of computation time that you need to take to emit that shortest path, right? So A star, lazy SP, all of these algorithms guarantee to you that the path that they return will be the shortest path. Like that's the, that's the promise that they make you. But what if you deliberately embraced suboptimality, right? Like what if you deliberately said like, ah, you know, do I really care about the optimal path? So I'm like trying to like get a robot to do something. What if I just 
you know, say, uh, I'll just take a feasible path, right? Now, the belief is that feasible paths, things that have poorer solution quality, lower is better, actually can be created faster. So I'm gonna give you like 10 seconds to think about why it might be faster to compute a suboptimal path. All right, hopefully you already have the answer, but the, the intuition is there are way more suboptimal paths than there are optimal paths, right? So like you've got a bigger target to hit, so you can easily hit that, right? That's the intuition. The details are super important. And so you generate a feasible path and you can then use what's called an anytime motion planning algorithm to generate better and better paths as you have more time. So anytime motion planning algorithms are called so because anytime you want it to give you an answer, pulls the best answer that it has out of its pocket and gives it to you, right? So there's a, a, a bunch of work that talks about uh, whether these anytime algorithms will converge to the shortest path. Like if you run an anytime algorithm, will you eventually get something that is the shortest path? Now notice here that the anytime algorithm will likely take more time to generate the shortest path than A star or any other optimal algorithm because like it's, like nothing comes for free, right? There's no free lunch. So anytime it emits a suboptimal path, it's doing some work that A star doesn't have to do. A star doesn't care, right? But the value of it is that like, if you want to stop at some point in the middle, you actually get something out. So a lot of, uh, there's a bunch of algorithms that talk about asymptotic optimality, which is um, uh, a phrase that um, I dislike. Uh, I mean, I like it, but I dislike it. Uh, Asymptotic optimality basically says, as the sands of time, you know, vanished, you know, as the heat depth of the universe occurs, would you have found your optimal path? And asymptotic optimality says, ah, eh, I think so. It doesn't even say yes, it says, ah, I think so. Um, so in some ways it's, it's comforting to know that like, you know, as we're all facing heat depth, the, uh, my algorithm would have converged to the optimal. But what you really, really care about is, well, when do I get my first path? Uh, or if I gave you like four seconds before my competitor wins the challenge that I'm participating in, how much is your suboptimality gap, right? Like what's the suboptimality gap that you have? This is a, an open problem in search. Um, and I'm gonna tell you today how we solved it. Um, so today I'll talk about sort of the first algorithm that does um, anytime motion planning with what's called sublinear regret. Uh, gives you a bound on the suboptimality gap. Um, so the key insight here again is that we're able to formalize anytime search uh, in the framework of Bayesian reinforcement learning. Um, and this is really valuable because a lot of super smart people have worked on Bayesian reinforcement learning and they have a lot of cool proofs and we just use those proofs. So this is another like life lesson, which is whenever you have a problem, like give it a name, turn it into, I don't know, a combinatorial optimization or Bayesian RL, and then just steal all of their answers and then boom, you're done. Um, so, you know, what we did something super simple and, and interesting, which is we formalized anytime search as Bayesian RL. And I'll tell you how we went about doing that. And this is a, a paper that's sort of fresh off the press. So, uh, we look at what's called an anytime objective, right? Uh, we think of it as sort of an episodic problem where uh, at any time I ask uh, in every episode, my search algorithm outputs a path. I add up all the edges, edge costs, and I get something called W, which is the cost of my current path. Now, my anytime objective basically says, well, I wanna minimize the cumulative path length of all the paths that I have, right? Think of it as the area under the curve that I showed you before, right? Um, which means that it's encouraging me to find fast, first of all, it's encouraging me to find the first path fast, and it's encouraging me to find better paths faster, right? Very, very simple anytime objective. Um, now, I'm going to say that imagine I have some prior on the status of every edge, right? And I'll talk a little bit about this prior in a second. Um, now some prior over the worlds or some prior over my edges, whatever it comes uh, you know, from, from memory. Uh, this is really important because you can't be Bayesian without belief. 
I, it's just, it's impossible to do that. So I have a subjective prior or my collision statuses. Then you can reformulate the anytime objective as the Bayesian anytime objective, which is the cumulative path length under expectation, right? Like under the expectation of the world, like imagine I have the universe drawing a world out of this belief distribution over worlds that I have, like what is, how good am I with, uh, with respect to that expectation, right? So that's the Bayesian anytime objective. And any sort of broadly, any Bayesian planning algorithm uses the history of edge evaluations that it has, we're gonna call that Psi, uh, to compute a posterior probability, which looks like this, right? I, I use my history to eliminate all the things that don't work and keep the things that work. And then I'm just trying to be optimal with, with respect to my Bayesian anytime objective, right? That's, that's really, really simple. There's a, there's a more fundamental problem here like that I wanna introduce you to, which is what I call the experienced piano movers problem, right? Uh, and in, in a pithy sense, it's new piano, new house, same mover, right? So you're this experienced piano mover. You're not the novice piano mover of Schwartz and Scherier. It's been many years and you've moved a lot of pianos and boy, you're tired of moving pianos, but you know, I gotta move some pianos more before I retire. Um, and so the question you're asking is, well, I moved all these pianos, man. So how can I capture all of these experiences that I have, all of these pianos that I have moved to solve a new problem? Like surely I must be better than what I was before, right? So that's, that's the, this is a, a new problem definition that I'm giving you to think about. And the interesting thing here is that you can actually draw the equivalence to what's called episodic Bayesian reinforcement learning on a deterministic unknown MDP. So think of each of these houses that you're worked at as different unknown MDPs, and maybe there's an infinitum of them. And the true answer, the new house that you're in is one of those houses. And you're just trying to infer that house through M repeated episodes. So this is again, like I'm gonna ask you to change the way you think of search, right? I initially told you, don't think of edges, think of paths. And now I'm telling you, like, think of paths too, that's useful. But think of it as a search over the universes that I could be in, right? Like if I knew which universe I was in and I had already cached the optimal path, then I just need to recall that universe and then execute it, right? This is very similar to, you know, case-based reasoning from the 1970s or so. And so the game we're playing is to actually essentially just infer the unknown MDP through the repeated episodes that we have, right? And you can formalize this very elegantly in terms of uh, Bayesian regret, right? Which is, if I have my, currently my Kate policy in UK, um, how, how poor is it compared to the optimal policy that I would have had, right? If I ran everything with my optimal policy, I compute my regret with respect to that optimal policy, and I take that under expectation, then I get what's called Bayesian regret, right? Um, one of the things that uh, we were able to prove in our paper, which is really cool and simple and interesting, is that, the, that minimizing Bayesian regret can actually be reduced pretty exactly to minimizing the Bayesian anytime motion planning objective. So anytime motion planning is just minimizing Bayesian regret in a particular formulation of Bayesian RL, which is kind of cool. Um, and no regret algorithms, right? These algorithms that talk about no regret is equivalent to asymptotic optimality. So if you prove an algorithm is no regret, like it just means that like, oh, eventually like regret will go away. So anyway, don't believe in no regret uh, uh, because it's about the same as uh, asymptotic optimality, right? What you really want is a regret bound, right? Like you actually want a bound on whether you have linear or hopefully sublinear regret. So um, this gives us a completely different way of looking at search again, right? Think of search as, well, I have some posterior distribution over the universes that I could be in. And I have a proposer, whoever that proposer might be, who proposes a world from that distribution. Like I'm gonna tell you three ways in which you can propose a world and they all lead to three different algorithms, which is kind of cool. And then once that world is created, then you use lazy SP or whatever algorithm you want to validate that world. And if you find a feasible path in that world, just emit it. Right? Uh, you reevaluate re re your edge statuses, update your posterior, propose a world, keep doing that. Right? Super simple algorithm, but like this encompasses 
pretty much most of any time search as well as search itself. Right? And we show that in the paper. Um, and with a particular type of proposer, which is posterior sampling, uh, you can actually pull all the regret bounds from um, Thompson sampling literature and create a sublinear regret bound pretty easily. Right? Um, Thompson sampling essentially says, well, I'm just gonna sample a world like I'm from this posterior that I have. And I'm gonna solve that, I'm gonna emit my answer and you can get what's called sublinear regret. The key here is the square root uh, under which everything exists, right? That means that you have linear would be T, sublinear regret is square root of T, right? Which is really nice. Um, and so this is essentially the first sort of regret analysis of any time search. We were able to show that this particular search algorithm that we identified has sublinear regret, which is really nice. So it's not it's way more stronger than, than no regret. So, um, and you know, essentially it solves one shortest path per proposal. Um, so I'm gonna go back and, and, and restate myself. Before I said like, oh, be optimistic. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And now I'm telling you just sample randomly. Like what the hell am I talking about? So a lot of it really depends on the proposer. Optimism in the face of uncertainty guarantees the shortest path. I right? think about it, right? If I'm always optimistic, then I'm either gonna be correct and I'm gonna give you the best path, or I'm gonna eliminate something that I thought was correct. And then I'm gonna do the next thing, and I'm either gonna to, going to be correct, or I'm gonna eliminate something that I thought was not correct. Like OFU algorithms are really useful if you wanna guarantee the shortest path. Bayesian regret is actually really, really useful if you wanna guarantee any time performance, right? You're like, hey man, just give me paths, and hopefully they're better, and hopefully I have like sublinear regret, right? There's one more that you can do, uh, which is actually Bayes optimal, right? You can say like, oh, I'm not just, I'm just gonna like solve this part of the key and, uh, and keep running it. Now that is actually really useful if you wanna emit a feasible path really fast, right? It's like, oh, I'm gonna do all this like careful machinery such that I can produce something that is optimal under expectation. So if you care about producing a feasible path really fast, you wanna, you wanna be Bayes optimal. It comes at a huge cost. But Bayesian regret gives you a good anytime performance. So the way you choose your proposer, whether you're being OFU or you're, whether you're optimizing Bayesian regret or whether you're being Bayes optimal, really emits like all these algorithms automatically, right? So you can just you can just get a shortest path algorithm. If you're OFU, you can get anytime performance if you, you optimize Bayesian regret and you can get a really fast feasible path if you're Bayes optimal, right? So just pick the right proposer and you get the right answer, right? And so this is the algorithm in a nutshell, right? It says, well, I have my posterior, um, sample a world and compute the shortest path, validate it using lazy SP, hey, because it's optimal, right? And then update your posterior and you know, sample a world, find the shortest path, validate it, and keep going on forever. This is like, again, the world's simplest algorithm that you can think of if you have a fire over your worlds, right? Um, so there is devil in the details, uh, there's devil in the proof. Uh, proof is uh, pretty, pretty challenging, but hey, it's been done so you don't have to think about it. Um, but uh, one of the interesting uh, questions he asked is like, well, man, like how do you use this posterior distribution, right? Um, posterior distributions, again, are one of the, in my mind, like one of the most important ways in which you can encode priors into your search for your policy learning algorithm, right? Um, it has this very, very simple concept, which I stole from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which is like when you eliminated the impossible, like whatever remains is the truth, right? So you just keep eliminating impossible things. And in the end, you end up with the right answer, right? Um, and, and this is like very Bayesian, right? Like without distributions, there's no way you can get to see So how do you actually create these distributions? Um, we actually use some pretty simple ways. Like one is if you have absolutely no idea of your nearest of, of your structure, you can use something like a nearest neighbor method. Like you can create your density function. Maybe you have a beta prior and then you're just updating it based on sort of some Bernoulli distribution. So it essentially says that like things close to me are probably have the same label that I have. The more interesting thing is what we call the finite set prior, which is that if I have a million or some number of worlds that I could be in, then I can actually compute, like analytically compute the posterior distribution over those known worlds, right? So like maybe I have corridors that have doors that open or close, 
maybe I have a coffee table with a bunch of objects that can be in different ways, I can actually compute better priors using those. Of course, all Bayesian methods sort of live and die by the priors and procedures that they have, right? Like if you have garbage priors, you're going to have garbage procedure and you're going to have a garbage algorithm. It'll be, it doesn't matter whether it's Bayes optimal or not, your constants will be terrible. So um, how does it perform? So we compare uh, lazy SP here. This is just a quick illustration. Uh, I want you to think a little bit about these plots because on the x-axis is the number of configurations that we uh, evaluate. On the y-axis is the path length, right? So if I look at lazy SP on one end, it has no path because it immediately emits the optimal solution after some number of iterations. POMP, which is a, uh, an algorithm that we developed before uh, called Pareto Optimal Motion Planning, which traces out the Pareto frontier, you know, is the blue curve over there. Ideally, you want this curve to be as close to the lower left as possible. You want to find the first solution super fast, and you want to improve to the optimal solution way better, right? And as you can see, PSMP dominates these other algorithms, right? Like everything is to the lower left of everything else, right? And so that's that's pretty useful. That's nice. Um, as we beat uh, an existing state of the art algorithm. Um, now, this is just an illustration in a two dimensional world, but uh, we actually ran experiments, um, thankfully using someone else's benchmark. Uh, this is from Qureshi et al. So thanks to them for giving us their benchmark which essentially has a, a Baxter arm that's uh, in front of a table that's moving objects around that random, right? This is again, one of the values of benchmarking is that then you can use and have apples to apples comparisons between different people. Um, so uh, since this is a talk that is broadcast to folks at MIT, I wanted to uh, compare their favorite algorithm, RRT star. Um, so I'm gonna disk that algorithm a bit. Uh, so first of all, uh, the Kahneman and Fazoli algorithm the Kahneman and Fazoli paper is one of the benchmark papers in search. You should read it. Um, it makes very little sense when you read it the first, but it starts to make sense as you read it, you know, the 60th time. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really groundbreaking in the mathematical machinery that it was able to pull from combinational geometry into search, right? Um, I think it's, it's, I would say it's equivalent to David Sue's paper on epsilon, alpha, beta, uh, expansiveness and configuration spaces. Um, you can compare that to a much simpler algorithm, which is RRT Connect. Uh, RRT Connect essentially runs an RRT and does path sorting after that. Uh, and this is a plot uh, of the performance. Like I said, lower left is better. And as you can see, RRT Connect like sort of uh, dominates uh, the RRT star algorithm. Um, which means that, like, you know, please do consider using RRT plus path shortening before you resort to algorithms like RRT star. Um, and on the right, you can see not just the, um, the Pareto curve of length versus configurations, but also the success rate. Like, how quickly are you able to generate the first solution? Again, sort of RRT uh, plus path shortening, like, really dominates that. So I want you to look at the x-axis of this big plot, you know, zero, 50,000, 100,000, 150,000, because that's gonna help you understand the next plot, um, which is how our algorithm compares to those, right? So our algorithm uh, essentially dominate, both pump as well as PSMP dominate uh, RRT star, RRT star is not even in this plot, uh, but also RRT with patch shortening, um, which is actually a really useful, thing to think about, like always try, uh, if you're running an enchant planner, always compare yourself against RRT path shortening because that's really easy to implement. And so we're able to outperform that pretty well. Why are we able to do that? Um, I think two reasons, right? Like one is um, the algorithm itself is very deliberately choosing between how to reduce uncertainty and how to emit paths, right? Like that's the value of the sublinear regret bound that you have is that it, like it does the, it does a fairly optimal trade-off between those two automatically. The second, I must say, is the informative priors that we have, right? Like the better priors you have, the better your algorithm will do, right? Like if I gave this like utterly arbitrary priors, then I bet I could move it like much farther along the way, right? So I wanna, uh, wrap up this section with um, just a statement, right? Which is um, we're able to formalize any kind of search uh, in the framework of Bayesian reinforcement learning, right? Um, and I think the the value of this is not not just the answer that we provided; it's it's actually a very first step towards many answers. 
But really the question that we're asking, right? Okay, now that I've shown you that anytime search is Bayesian RL, can we use other algorithms uh, from Bayesian RL in anytime search? And also secondly, can we prove regret bounds for other anytime search algorithms, right? This is an open question, right? We haven't done any of that. We proved that regret, we proved that one particular anytime planning algorithm had sublinear regret, right? So there's there's a lot more that can be done here. Um, I also wanna, um, oh, there's my daughter. Hello. How much? Five minutes? No. Okay. I'll come soon. I got, <laughs> I'm gonna pause for a second. Uh, I'll come in 10 minutes. No. Okay, two minutes. Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> Apparently I have to go hang out with my daughter in two minutes. Sorry guys. Um, the uh, experienced piano mowers problem, right? Uh, this I think is like an interesting problem to look at, uh, which is, um, I think it's a generalization of the piano mowers problem, right? Uh, you have a, a wealth of experience, a history of experience. How do you encode that experience optimally, carefully, interestingly, such that you can solve new problems? I challenge you all to actually build better algorithms for the experienced piano mowers problem and you know, for some theorems about it. Um, so the, the key insight for me has been, like, and thanks to all the people who came before me, is search is really about eliminating paths. Um, you can eliminate paths using optimal substructure, right? That's the machinery of uh, Bellman optimality and Bellman condition. Or you can eliminate paths by using posterior distributions and eliminating worlds. But really, at the core of search is this question of, like, how do I create belief distributions over the simple paths that I might be able to take, right? I have many futures that I can take. Like, how do I create a distribution over my futures and just pick one, right? Whether you pick it Bayes optimally or OFU or with Bayesian regret, uh, you get different algorithms. So this is another like interesting question for all of you is just sort of think about how do you build good distributions over the paths that you might encounter? And I think that I would also contend that like reinforcement learning um, is not very different from eliminating policies. Like I lift paths uh, to policies, I lift, uh, deterministic problems to stochastic shortest path problems. And likewise, you can think about using the Bellman condition, optimal substructure, your policy gradient algorithm, as well as thinking about ways in which you eliminate worlds, right? So thinking about how you might want to formulate Bayesian reinforcement learning also in terms of this framework is really useful. Uh, we have um, a, a very preliminary paper on this, um, on formulating Bayesian residual policy optimization in terms of Bayesian RL, right? Which is pretty much a similar idea. Um, I, I want to sort of end with sort of going back to uh, Ariel's talk. Um, I hope he's listening to this or he listens to this because he really changed how I think of search. Um, sadly or happily, you know, the heart of heuristic search is still beating, continues to beat. Uh, and there's still every problem that we discover, we're uh, discovering new answers, but also discovering even more problems like the experience piano movers problem. So I think this is a gift that keeps on giving. Um, some, some sort of more general pieces of advice, right? Exploit structure, right? Um, if you have a, a black box algorithm that takes data and outputs like inferences, um, that is almost always gonna be worse than actually opening the box and exploiting the structure that exists, whether it's Bellman structure or about the structure of the world. Um, I would also recommend you to listen to Byron Boots's um, RSS uh, early career keynote talk. Uh, where he talked about many different ways in which you can exploit structure, but like machine learning is useless unless you actually are able to codify the structure that exists in your problem and actually find efficient ways to exploit it. Um, and of course, if you want to really think about how you might want to exploit structure in uh, motion planning, I highly recommend you to read uh, Sanjuban's um, IGRR paper and PhD thesis. Um, the second piece of advice is I embrace laziness. Um, I, I think find the thing that costs the most time, compute, pain in your problem, and then don't do it. And see how far you can go without doing it. And it turns out that like you can go pretty far without evaluating it. You can just, just keep going and, uh, and you can get, get there, but understand what the laziness there is. And then finally, this is me being a comagen, like, you know, just prove some damn theorems. Um, and, and hopefully they're not just asymptotic optimality and something more, more fundamental than that. Um, one last sort of like in that note, I would say, um, I tell my students that there's a sort of two dimensional space of 
theory and system. You know, it's a highly multi-dimensional space, but to me, there's two dimensions. And the papers that I dislike are the ones that sort of smear themselves somewhere along this space, right? Um, and my advice has always been like aim for the corners, right? It doesn't matter whether you, ideally you wanna aim for the top right corner where you have a glorious theory and glorious system, but I'd rather you either build a amazing system that nobody else has or build amazing theory that nobody else has built, right? So, you know, in terms of norm minimization, minimize your L infinity norm rather than your L2 or L1 norm, right? Um, aim, definitely aim for the corners because that's where the most value is. And of course, I wanna thank all of my co-authors of the papers that I talk about here. Um, wanna talk about, thank some collaborators who are not in these papers, uh, really fantastic people that I talked to. Um, I have a special section. I wanna thank some smarty pants uh, who I talk to very often and whose papers I read often. Um, I miss you all and I, I wish I could talk to you more. And of course, uh, all my uh, fantastic uh, funders and friends. And check out my papers, whatever you want. Thank you. Uh, I want to end also one more thing. Uh, oh man, I keep ending. Um, I'm spending some time at Amazon and um, I started this organization called Robotics AI. Uh, you can go check it out and uh, learn more about it. Um, and if you want to hear more, come talk to me. Uh, it's my attempt at going to the uh, top left corner of that two dimensional space of building uh, systems at scale and uh, just delivering your packages faster than uh, you want them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sid. Klaus, thank you very much for this great talk. Um, this was very exciting, entertaining, loved the amoebas and all the um, great explanation of the algorithms. So we can't wait to get started with the panel discussions. I hope your daughter is giving us some time. Uh, and <laughs> we have I think so. I'll, I'll just have it on my lap, it's fine. <laughs> all right. So we have many questions ourselves and also submitted by the audience already. So just a few logistics for the audience. Below the live stream on our webpage, you can submit questions or upload an existing question. And we will pick up these questions during the panel discussion. And uh, part of the panel today are Rachel Holliday, Nima Faseli, Hank Young, as well as Alberto Rodrigo, uh, Rodriguez, sorry, and myself, uh, Janet Volk. And we also have today two great guest panelists. Uh, so first we have Shinwa Ikena, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Albany. And she directs the Robotics, Algorithms, and Computable Systems Laboratory. And Dr. Kenna's research centers on intelligent motion planning applied to robotics and proteins. And as a second guest uh, panelist, we have Costas Becris, who was also mentioned in Sid's uh, talk, uh, who is associate professor at the Computer Science Department of, of Rutgers University. He's also directing the Praxis Research Group, who works on robot planning, data-driven control, and perception. And with that, I would like to invite uh, Xinhua to ask her first question to Sid. Hi, Sid. Um, thank you so much for this very um, interesting talk. I, I, I've been writing all through, <laughs> trying to get as much as I can as well. So um, I was really interested in, you know, you had you started off with this whole amoeba example in terms of how it works with the A star. And then basically you were talking about the slime and then you're talking about at the point where it dies and how you limit the slime. So working with all of that very interesting example, how does this now fit into this um, new concept you're talk talking about the Bayesian um, method and the regret bound and how you have this posterior distribution? Is there a way you could marry what you talked about with the amoeba with also what it represents within that framework? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that. You know, I, I usually <laughs> work on, uh... Uh, most of my life is consumed in trying to describe all of my algorithms in terms of amoebas and slime or mm -hmm. snails sometimes. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting point. I think that the, um, you know, there's, there's this interesting difference between optimism in the face of uncertainty and um, posterior sampling, right? Um, which I was describing in the, you know, in, in my slides, which is that um, 
the amoebas dying are basically sacrificing themselves for the optimal amoeba, right? It's mm -hmm. like, uh, there's this optimal amoeba that you want to keep pushing forward. You're like, keep going, keep going. And, and they're sort of dying en masse because they want this optimal amoeba to keep going forward. I think the, the anytime planning essentially says that um, it, it's more of a, a holistic view in that uh, every amoeba who makes it to the end, like, you know, helps you with your Bayesian regret, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. as you, as more amoebas make it, they are, they're helping you better and better with Bayesian regret. So there are still amoebas that are dying, but they're, um, the, this is a, a, a bit of a, a more holistic um, optimization function that you're looking at. So yeah. I think the, do you have a way of looking at it? I mean, I think the, 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 the words uh, idea is also interesting in that um, these amoebas are, I'm, I'm just making this up on the spot, yeah. by the way, so it's probably totally wrong. Um, these amoebas are all dreaming about, you know, their ideal world, right? Like each amoeba, not only slimes, but like has in its mind a picture of a utopia, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the world that it's, that it sits in. And it's like, you know, who is, who, who among the world, who in the world can prevent me from like following my dream of, uh, of utopia? And each amoeba is just like, oh, I'll just, I'll just keep going along this utopian dream. And as soon as it reaches a dead end of like its, its utopian dream has been shattered by the cruelties of reality, it dies, right? So that's my, that's my crude analogy of uh, Bayesian regret, which is that like, in addition to sort of Bellman condition of slime, each amoeba has in its mind the utopia that it wants to be in and, uh, and dies if that utopia is no longer true. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sid. Uh, Costas, what's your first question for Sid? Uh, thanks, Sid, for the, for the great talk. Um, so uh, I want to go uh, on one of your messages, you know, optimistic under uncertainty. And um, it, it attracted my interest because I, I've, I remember myself saying to my students in multiple cases, uh, in the face of uncertainty, it's better to be conservative. Uh, and I want to see whether perhaps we are aligned on that. I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense in the case of full observability, right? And in, uh, in this case, you actually know, eventually, you have all the information to go and vision check the edges because you do know the world. But what about mm -hmm. partial observability or dynamic environments? Um, does the same message uh, transfer? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that the 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 trade-off between sort of conservatism and um, optimism, right, is this trade-off between um, whether you want to be uh, OFU or, or Bayes optimal, for example. Like Bayes optimality essentially says, oh, I got all these options. I'm going to take this sort of average-ish option sort of under expectation of my the actions that I can take. Um, I think part of it is also the, like you were saying, the consequences of being optimistic, right? Um, if the consequences of being optimistic are irreversible, for example, like if you get into an irreversible state, then obviously like it's super important to be very, very conservative. And so I think um, the, the value of optimism, like in you know, an algorithm like RMAX, right, is that you will be able to um, guarantee the optimal solution that's possible, right? Um, I would also say that like, you know, D star light, right, or a D star algorithm, is an OFU algorithm, right? It essentially says, given the world that I have, I'm gonna do the best thing I can. And then when my world changes, I'm gonna do something something different. Um, I think conservatism is, I, I think you can, the, the other way of looking at it very quickly is in terms of risk sensitivity, right? How sensitive or insensitive are you to risk? And as you get more and more sensitive to risk, then you might wanna think about how you would wanna dial back your optimism. Great. So, so let me then also ask uh, one more uh, about asymptotic optimality. I, I think many people that, you know, they, they put asymptotic optimality on their papers, they will agree with you that asymptotic optimality is not the end of, uh, you know, uh, properties that you're interested in, in, in showing. Actually, I think simple random trees, you can show that they are asymptotic. Exactly. But what matters is the, is the rate of convergence. Uh, to, to the optimal uh, solution. So uh, I think in the context of regret, the fact that you're showing uh, sublinear regret, that is equivalent to arguing that you're achieving 
um, a good convergence rate uh, to uh, highly optimal solutions? Um, I, I think that the, I, first of all, like I, I think I completely agree with you in that, like, yes, like I was gonna bring the example of like, you can take um, a random action every once in a while and you can prove that you can be asymptotically optimal, right? Like you just have to prove that you can densely cover your C space. <clears throat> and of course, like it's it's not easy, right? Uh, I think that's what the Kahneman and Fazoli paper shows that like, it's not easy to prove asymptotic abnormality, like no no dissing that fact, uh, but it's it's like, it's it's not practically very useful. Yes, yeah, I think the um, uh, sublinear regret tells us how quickly we'll get to the optimal solution, right? Um, I mean, of, co of course, here we're in finite worlds, right? Um, where you have a finite number of simple paths that you need to evaluate. It's combinatorial, but it's still finite. So it definitely gives us the rate of convergence, which is useful. Now, I would caveat myself and say that there's a bunch of constants in front of that, right? Uh, there's the size of your graph, there's like, you know, the length of your possible longest path. So I initially made you the promise of like, oh, I'll tell you how close you'll be in five seconds. Well, I'll tell you the order around which you'll be in five seconds, right? Like the details are, um, as you know, like computationally impossible to say how exactly close I'll be to optimality. Thank you. Um, Nima is next. He has a question from the audience. Great, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, we had a really interesting question from our audience stating that uh, what would your algorithms or approaches do if there isn't a solution to the problem in a given instance? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so all of these algorithms, um, will, so A star, for example, right, um, has the property, it's, it's a complete algorithm, right, which means that it will give you the optimal answer if it exists. It'll also give you, nope, I couldn't do it if it doesn't exist, right? So we, uh, that's actually really important. You don't want it to keep churning until you, you know, kill it. So certainly, um, you know, we need, you know, most all these algorithms are complete. Now, will they optimally tell you whether they're over or not? I mean, A star will, right? And lazy SP will, right? As you eliminate, uh, as you eliminate paths very sequentially, at some point you'll run out of paths to eliminate and you'll be done. Um, anytime algorithms won't, right? Like if you, if your goal was to say whether it's a path existed or not, like that, that's worse. Also, I would, I would say that if all you wanted was the Boolean answer, does a path exist or not? There's a much easier algorithm that you can run. I'm going to see if any of the panelists can guess that. You can basically guess that you can, you can run a fast algorithm to check if your, if your graph is like one connected, right? Like you can just see, do I have a connected graph, right? And that is actually much easier to run than finding any path whatsoever, right? Like you can run that super fast. So if all you needed is that Boolean answer, you can just run a connected check algorithm, that's all. Thanks, Sid. Uh, Hank, you had also a question from the audience. Yeah, so uh, Sid, uh, I have a question from the audience asking that uh, you presented a lot of algorithms today, but uh, how do these algorithms extend to systems with dynamics, uh, especially uh, non holonomic systems where you need a dynamically optimal trajectory other than just a pass? Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, there, there's multiple layers to this, right? And uh, I, let me go through some of the layers. So I've done a bunch of work in that too. Um, if you can actually solve the two point boundary value problem, right? Um, and you can solve it offline, for example, then you can create a graph out of non-holonomic, non-holonomically constrained problems also, right? Uh, for example, when in self-driving cars, uh, you may have a Dubin's path or a reach up path, whatever you want, you create what's called a state lattice, which is a pre-computed set of um, trajectories. And as long as they're connected, as long as you can create a graph, right? Then, then, you're, then you're all set. When you, uh, Tree search like problems, which don't close the loop and don't create graphs are actually particularly valuable when it is impossible. Actually, it's never impossible to solve the two-point boundary value problem, but it's really, really hard, really, really computationally expensive to solve the two-point boundary value problem. That's where value function methods or RRT-like methods or RRT star-like methods are actually pretty, RRT itself is pretty useful. Um, we, uh, there's actually some really nice work by Costas Beckeris on, uh, on, so, on extending and generalizing uh, RRT-like algorithms uh, with some, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, some Lipschitz assumptions about your value function uh, such that you can actually generalize them pretty elegantly um, for non-holonomically constrained systems without closing the loop. 
Uh, thanks, Sid, for answering those. So, Costas, you had another question. Uh, yeah, um, I think in, in some of your answers, and I think in your talk in general, you're taking um, the graph uh, here for, for granted in some sense, uh, in, in some sense, right? It's either explicitly built, perhaps through a roadmap, or implicitly defined through uh, the choices of the of the search approach. Uh, but I think for these continuous space problems, very frequently the challenge is coming up with the right graph. You know, uh, what are the uh, the actions uh, that you should even be considering in, in a certain case, and perhaps uh, reducing the graph itself before you get into the search uh, part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. I actually had a slide, a few slides on that. I took that out. But yes, uh, you know, you and I have both worked quite a bit on that problem too. Um, a few things, right? Like again, like let me go into at least two or three layers. Um, layer one statement is uh, don't use random geometric graphs. Um, they are fundamentally garbage. Um, what you care about is this property called uh, dispersion which is the largest open ball that you can stick between your points because that's the place, that's the largest obstacle that you can deal with, right? And, you know, obviously like this is known fact from like Penrose that um, pseudo random sequences, uh, Hausen sequences, Hammersley sequences, or even like state lattices have way better dispersion properties than random geometric graphs. The, the, the simple intuitive way is that random points clump and cluster violently in high dimensions. It's just ridiculously violently in high dimensions, right? And so don't use random geometric graphs. So think about like- Good for analysis, but not for actually solving a problem. Correct, yes. Artist graphs, you go to town on analysis, but like don't, don't actually use them. So I use uh, Hazen graphs, right? So I use Hazen sequences for creating multidimensional graphs. I, I prefer them over state lattices because you, know, you don't have to have this two to the N uh, requirement to reduce dispersion. That's statement one. Statement number two is, uh, Kost has brought up a, a really, really good point uh, as to where do I drop points in my search, right? Uh, there's actually some really nice work by Marco Pavone, which talks about learning samplers based on existing optimal paths, right? So I have a bunch of existing optimal paths. I can learn a sampler on that. Um, I, I like that work, but there's better work yeah, since. Um, partly by Marco and partly by others, that talks about how you might want to drop samples um, that are robust to perturbations. Like if you're always trying to be optimal, then if I perturb your world a little bit, then you're not going to be able to deal with various homotopic classes. And so, yes, th this is another open question of like generating samples that are actually relevant for solving your problem. The other thing is, again, um, people talk about like generating samples that are like narrow passages. Like, you know, anytime somebody mentions the word narrow passage, you, you know, a cat dies somewhere or something other bad thing happens. Um, first of all, like narrow passages don't really exist. And secondly, uh, if they do, um, you don't want to drop samples around every doorway in your house. You only want to drop samples around the doorways that you need to go through to go from your start to goal. So um, all of these sort of medial axis sampling, all these other sampling methods uh, tend to drop samples in every doorway in your house where you really care about the doorways that, that you would go through for solving your query. Thank you, Sid. So Rachel has some questions from the audience. Hi, Sensei. Um, we have two questions, one from Sin Hall and one from Anonymous that ask uh, basically about how the experience panel over his problem functions when you have a world that's changing a lot or is very dynamic. Um, there's a question about could that be co combined with belief of the world or would lazy SP really suffer because it's heuristic is wrong because the world is drastically different. What are your thoughts about that. I mean, I, I think uh, um, There's a very simple generalization um, to known dynamic environments right so if I know what the dynamic environment is, then I augment my state space with time. And then I'm doing planning in SD space, right? Of course, you need to guarantee that time is monotone, so you can go backwards in time to avoid an obstacle. But this is like a standard trick that we all use, right? Like you just augment your state space with time, and then you're just basically state latticing through space time, right? And so that's that's a very straightforward problem. If you know if the world is changing deterministically, all the guarantees are inherited uh, by these other problems. Now, if your world is changing um, in a way that you don't know, right? Um, you can take this SD planning uh, framework. Uh, I'm inventing a new problem and probably a solution. Um, and 
just use the same, what you need is a Bayesian belief distribution over space time, right? Like you need a Bayesian belief distribution. Let's say uh, extended common filter, this is straight out common filter that tells you how your world changes, changes over time. And my, I bet you can just take these existing algorithms and then apply that to space time and you would get pretty decent outcomes out of it. You would even get like one of the nice things about posterior sampling is what's called deep exploration. It will actually avoid things in anticipation of the world that it might face. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so Nima, do you want to pick one last audience question or a group of them? Yeah, I'm gonna combine a few of them into maybe one question. Um, and this is maybe a little bit more logistical. What would your advice be for students and researchers who would like to get a job at Amazon? What kind of problems should they be working on? What sort of skills should they have? Oh my, um, I, I think my, um, my general advice, like in general to anybody is just, you know, be fearless, right? Uh, we have a lot of really, really hard problems and you wanna just be as fearless as possible. Um, a PhD is fundamentally a, a walk off of a cliff. Like you don't know, nobody has solved these problems. And so you're gonna go solve them. So be really, really fearless about that. Um, my own particular organization, um, you know, we're, um, I own autonomous manipulation and autonomous mobility inside fulfillment centers. Trucks back in and packages come out with your name on them. And I own the manipulation and mobility of everything that happens inside. Um, and we're sort of moving the needle on what we can do with fulfillment, right? So there are packages that you have received that have been manipulated by my robots. Um, and that's super exciting. I think the skills that we're looking for are broadly the skills that um, any strong researcher or scientist or engineer would have, right? Which is um, the ability to deal with ambiguity, the, the ability to uh, work through, working backwards is actually a very, one of those philosophies that I've taken quite a bit from Amazon is just like, do whatever it takes to solve the problem. Don't be super prescriptive about how you solve it. Like if you walk into you know, any problem and say like, I am gonna use deep learning to solve X. Uh, my first point would be like, why? Like, what is this problem? <laughs> like, what is, what is going on? What is this madness? Um, but I think the, and then that sort of uh, permeates all the way to, um, to Amazon too. It's very much a working backwards culture, but we have, um, my org uh, has people in Seattle, in Boston, in Boulder, and in Berlin. So if you're interested worldwide, just uh, get in touch with me anytime. Thank you very much, Sid. Uh, we don't wanna take more time of you away from your, uh, from your kids uh, or uh, that you are stealing your, their room more for more time from them. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to thank you for the, the uh, the really good talk, um, all the insight that you gave us into um, somehow difficult, uh, simple, but at the same time difficult concepts to grasp in search. Um, and also on the uh, advice for people that want to get into robotics. Um, I think that that's one message that we've been trying to convey uh, in robotics today is that robotics is not um, Unimodal, right? So this is a very broad discipline that if you want to um, sort of make progress, you have to be aware of or understand many different fields. And we've had talks on perception from uh, Andrew Davidson, learning from Leslie Kebling, soft robotics from Allison Okamura, HRI from Anka Dragan, uh, humanoids from Scott Quindersma, safe learning and control from Naira Hovakimian, and motion planning from you. And uh, these are just some of the areas where um, if you want to be a full stack roboticist, um, uh, you you have to understand and, uh, and dominate. So thank you very much, Sid, for contributing to that. And um, we are, this is the last talk of the first sort of series of talks and we're going to take now a break of a month and we'll come back in September uh, with more energy. Thank you very much Sid for uh, um, spending all this time with us. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. It was fantastic. Take care.